Okay. The following interview was conducted with Kenneth Meyer, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Extension and Continuing Education for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on um, Wednesday, July the 9th, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank Tell you. us a little about where you were born and your parents and siblings and growing up in your early years. Well, I was born on a farm near Loudoun, Iowa, which is a small community in eastern Iowa between Cedar Rapids and Clinton. Um, I have two brothers. Uh, they are uh, 12 and uh, 15 years older than I am. And my father died when I was two years old. And uh, so my mother uh, and two brothers uh, farmed the home farm for a good number of years till I got old enough to help with it. And uh, it was a typical small town farm. We raised cattle and hogs and chickens and corn and hay and oats. And What was early school? Where'd you go to school, your grade school? I went to a parochial school. I went to Trinity Lutheran School in Loudoun for eight years and then uh, went to Loudoun High School and uh, played basketball and baseball, which were the only two sports that we had for boys in those days. Interestingly enough, they had girls basketball in Iowa back in those days, uh, but it was three on three instead of uh, the typical five on five. Uh, and then I uh, went to uh, Iowa State uh, and got my DVM degree in uh, 1957. And after I uh, graduated, uh, I worked uh, for a practitioner in Cozad, Nebraska, which is in the Platte Valley uh, in central Nebraska. Uh, interesting experience because it was very different from the area in which I'd grown up. And Cozad had the distinct distinction of being the world's largest alfalfa producing and shipping center. Uh, unfortunately, the distinction came with it because there was an odor from the alfalfa processing plants, which when you, when you drove into town the first time, you were very aware of it, but after you lived there a while, it was, <laughs> it was over. Yeah. And then I came to uh, practice. Let me, let me interrupt. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about college. Did, was it four years and then to vet school, or how did that go? No, it was, uh, I had three years of pre-vet and then uh, four years of veterinary school. I see. So the program was a little bit different than it yeah, is. Yeah, it was, you could get in uh, after two years. Uh, I took three years uh, before I uh, got into veterinary school and then the four-year program. Okay. okay. And uh, it was a uh, very different program <laughs> than it is today. Uh, some of the, the subjects are still the same, but the methods of teaching are, are very different. And in those days, we used to have uh, very uh, a, a large number of uh, laboratories uh, where we would spend three to four hours in a laboratory doing uh, oh, microbiology uh, uh, tests uh, where we'd inoculate various sugars and that sort of thing to identify an organism. And uh, now they they don't do any of that. They have very few labs and and a lot of lectures and a lot of studying on their own. But uh, in those days, uh, you you went to school about eight o'clock in the morning and you were there till pretty much five o'clock uh, at night every day. And uh, Saturday mornings you went from eight to twelve. Do you live on campus? What was campus like at those then when you were there? I started out in uh, a dormitory and then I uh, pledged a fraternity, uh, Phi Kappa Tau, and I lived uh, off campus uh, in the fraternity for three years and then uh, I roomed with some other vet students for a couple years and then moved back into the fraternity for the last uh, mm -hmm. couple years and I met my wife at Iowa State and so uh, we were married our last year and we lived in an apartment uh, right on, on Lincoln Way, the ma main con transcontinental highway, which was an which interesting is cool. experience. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, then continue after you finish there. Uh, well, after I, as I said, I practiced mm -hmm. in Coza, Nebraska, and then uh, uh, 
we decided that we wanted to live somewhere between our two sets of parents. My mother was in Iowa and my wife was from New Jersey and so we split the difference and said from the middle of uh, Ohio to the middle of Indiana. And I, so then I started a practice in Albany, Indiana, which is north of Muncie. What type of practice? Small it animal, large a, animal? It was a mixed practice. When I went there, it was about 90% large animal and 10% small animal. Uh, when I left there uh, uh, to come to Purdue in 1964, uh, it was uh, about 50-50, 50% small and 50% large. Um, Again, it was a small community, and it was similar to the kind of town that I mm -hmm. grew up in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then tell us a little about when you came to Purdue. How did you happen to come to Purdue? <clears throat> well, I had made my uh, decision that I was going to leave practice uh, sometime uh, within the next five years. And uh, there was an extension veterinarian at Purdue named Stan, Dr. Stan Bauer. And uh, he had been with a commercial pharmaceutical company before he came to Purdue. And so I called him and asked him if he'd kind of tell me about uh, what, wha what I should look for if I interviewed at a pharmaceutical company. And he said, uh, would you be interested in coming to Purdue? There's an extension veterinarian's position open. And I said, you know, I don't know what an extension veterinarian does. And so he and uh, Dean Erskine Morris came down and spent a day in my practice riding with me and talking about what they expected an extension veterinarian to do. And I came up to Purdue and interviewed about a month later and uh, gave a seminar for the students. And uh, I was uh, surprised that the students weren't all sitting there with rapt attention, uh, anticipating my every word. Uh, in fact, as I recall, a couple of them may have been sleeping. But uh, uh, okay. after that, uh, about a month after that, they offered me a position, and I started uh, December 1 of 1964. Okay. What was the extension? Tell us what type of position. Now, was it a new position, and were you affiliated with the Cooperative Extension Service? It was uh, with the Cooperative Extension Service, and uh, Dr. Fred Hall, who was the first uh, extension veterinarian in modern times at Purdue, um, was retiring. He had retired uh, the previous September, and so uh, um, I was actually filling his position, and uh, my job was uh, principally with uh, beef cattle at that time. Uh, Dr. Stan Bauer was uh, covering hogs, and Dr. Ken Weinman was covering dairy cattle at that time. And about the same time they did hire a new position, Dr. Richard Baum uh, came to Purdue from Iowa. He'd been a practitioner out there, and he took uh, poultry at that time. Uh, Dick only stayed about a year, and then he left. and. Uh, they never really filled that position mm -hmm, again. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the campus like when you came? What about housing and things when you came in the 60s? Um, we uh, actually built a house uh, when we moved here uh, up on Cumberland Avenue, and uh, we were the uh, uh, second house uh, in that subdivision up there. And uh, we built right across from the school because we thought it'd be convenient for our kids, and we've never regretted that even after our kids were long gone. Uh, we've enjoyed living across the street from the school. Mm -hmm. Keeps you young. Uh, the campus was a lot smaller then. Uh, the uh, facilities have changed tremendously since then. Uh, and it was a lot easier to get around campus then because you could drive about anywhere on campus. It was a little more dangerous though because the students were sure. constantly running across the street early in the fall, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a nice place in those days and 
have fond memories of it. What was the facilities for the vet school? I know they've expanded, but what was it? The build, what were the buildings that were there at that time? Well, at that time, the the school was about uh, five years old, and so the facilities were really pretty new, and uh, they existed that way uh, up until 1995 when a new building was dedicated. But uh, the old uh, veterinary path building, the old veterinary science building, uh, was incorporated into the new building, and it uh, it made a nice combination. Mm -hmm. uh, facilities in those days uh, were pretty good for uh, veterinary schools because it was one of the newest sure. in the country. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your teaching. What were some of the courses and some of the involvement with the students? Well, you know, initially I started out, I didn't have very much involvement mm -hmm. with students because my work was principally extension and it was uh, uh, visiting uh, uh, problem cases with veterinarians throughout on the, farms. Throughout the state? Throughout the state. And then conducting meetings for uh, uh, producers uh, initially on uh, beef cattle problems, but then later on uh, after Dr. Stan Bauer died in 1968, uh, I took over the swine area as well. Uh, I, uh, I took a sabbatical in 1972 at Michigan State, and it, while I was there, I took a course from Dr. Norman Kagan called Interpersonal Process Recall, and we had to do some videotaping of ourselves in that, and I learned a lot from that, and I thought, gee, uh, I would have liked to had that kind of exposure before I went into practice. And so I, I uh, started a course, uh, veterinary client relations uh, for senior students. It was an elective. And we videotaped them uh, doing interviews with clients. And those clients usually were uh, practicing veterinarians who came in to help out with the course. And we let students uh, see how they interacted with people. And, and also, uh, we gave them an opportunity to critique each other. Uh, I tried to avoid saying this is the way to do it or this is not the way to do it, but instead let them come up with their own evaluations of it. And it seemed like they learned an awful lot about themselves that way and how they wanted to do things. And it made them start to think about how, how do I want to run a practice when I graduate? And I've had a lot of... Uh, uh, letters and comments back from graduates of the class that said, yeah, I really appreciated that uh, look at myself. Uh, so I have a better feel, yeah. how I can improve or, or not do it or whatever. That's right. Sure. And the other area that I taught, helped teach uh, in was swine medicine. And uh, uh, one of the things that I had uh, put together in 65 was a, or 75 was a uh, simulation program for veterinarians where we went out and videotaped a farm with its problems and uh, then we would bring in uh, practicing veterinarians and let them look at the farm and, and decide what the problems were and how they would resolve those. And so we use those uh, in teaching swine medicine as well and let the students do the same thing. Sure. That sounds very, very good. And so you, and, uh, you did some outreach then with, the, with your uh, extension would be primarily and then... With uh, both extension sure. and separate from that, although it's really a part of it, was continuing education. And... Uh, yeah, tell us a little about that in the state well, association. My responsibility was to provide continuing education programs for uh, the veterinarians in the state. And while uh, I didn't provide them myself, I arranged for them and, and put them together. Uh, of course, the biggest one was always the annual fall conference for veterinarians, which had been going on for 
some 60 years before I ever arrived here, and uh, it still continues today, and it's still a very popular conference. But we held uh, surgery workshops for them, and we held uh, uh, programs where uh, they had hands-on experience, uh, and they also had some that were just straight lectures. Uh, usually there were between 30 and 50 people would attend one of those, except for the conference, which was several hundred. Did they need it for CEUs for, for continued certification? Was that? They didn't at that time. As oh. a matter of fact, uh, there, there was always a debate uh, among continuing education people uh, of whether or not the government should require uh, continuing education or whether professionals should do this as a, a part of just keeping themselves current. And as a result of that, we started the Indiana Academy of Veterinary Medicine, which was a part of the Indiana Veterinary Medical Association. And uh, practitioners would keep uh, track of their continuing education, and they had to they had to acquire 40 units or 40 hours of continuing education every two years in order to qualify for the academy. And that was a pretty popular program until uh, eventually the uh, state required that uh, they have continuing education to keep up their licensure and they had to document it to the state. And so while the academy still exists, it doesn't have its its sure. importance that it had at one time. Right. Have the format of the programs changed? I imagine maybe with the curriculum or? Well, the format of the programs changed a lot with the ability uh, of TV. Sure. And sure. Uh, uh, when, when I first started, almost all the programs were done with uh, slides in a carousel and uh, the speaker flipping up the slides one at a time. Now PowerPoint presentations and uh, uh, videotapes and uh, uh, sometimes actual videos of uh, live events uh, have changed all of that. Right. It makes it a little more, it brings it down into the focus you right. know, for today. Um, one of the things that I think you were involved in was that NLM grant for the state veterinarians. Uh, that was a, a very interesting program, as you know, because uh, two people, uh, uh, Catherine Marquis, who was interviewing me, and uh, Miriam Drake uh, came to me one day and said, uh, uh, the National Library of Medicine has a, a program that is providing grants for innovative ways to provide information to professionals. And uh, that sounded like an interesting program. I'm sure glad you, you did that because we did apply for a grant and we got the grant. And as a result, we set up uh, the uh, information center, veterinary information center in the school. And we were fortunate to get a person, uh, Judy Nielsen, who had a background in uh, biology and medicine, and she served as the resource person where veterinarians could call in and request information about a particular subject, and Judy would go to the uh, uh, Library of Medicine uh, uh, websites and pull out that information and send it back to the veterinarians. Or sometimes they would just call and ask a question and she would pull up the information and call them back and give them the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, little did we dream back then, you gotta remember this was 1976, and little did we, I, I would have never anticipated that veterinarians would have been able to access information over the internet uh, in the manner that they do today. Right. Uh, this was a, a kind of a tiny footstep towards that. Uh, 
It was a valuable thing. Veterinarians rated it highly as long as it was a free service. But when they had to pay for it, it dropped off considerably because uh, they were, they were uh, unwilling to pay what it would cost to provide that service. Now, of course, they can go to their computer sure, and right. get 10 times the information that we were able to pro right. provide then. But in those days, it was a valuable service. And I, I think that it did a lot to bring practicing veterinarians and the school together. And it also, uh, what you would call some of the uh, innovators and early adopters in, uh, of trying to get that information, it got them started looking at uh, other sources rather than just books and, and journals. Sure. Good point, yeah, that's right. What was your, uh, you served up a couple of deans. When you came, Dr. Morris was the dean, and then... Erskine Morris right? was the dean who hired me, and uh, he was the dean from uh, uh, from my term of 1964 to 1970. Uh, Jack Stockton was the uh, associate dean, been there a couple years uh, before 1970, and he took over as interim dean and then subsequently was named dean. Uh, and he served as dean from 1970 to 1985. And then uh, Hugh Lewis took over as dean. Uh, he actually came in 1986. Uh, he, uh, he had been uh, appointed as dean, but he had some obligations with the uh, uh, pharma pharmaceutical company that he was with that he had to fulfill before he could actually come on board. And so in that period, uh, uh, Dr. Billy Hooper kind of uh, mm -hmm. took over. Yeah, right. And then they have, and then after Doc, after Hugh Lewis was then Alan did Well, uh, I retired, when I retired, uh, Hugh Lewis was still dean. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, Alan Rebar followed uh, Hugh Lewis and then uh, uh, Willie Reed followed yeah. Al Rebar. Right. So. Dr. Morris, is he still, is he passed, he's passed away though, hasn't he? Yes, he? Dr. Morris uh, died, oh boy, it's been oh. at least 10, 12 years sure. ago. Sure, right, okay. Um, any particular comment on your re specific research areas that you've been involved in and getting support for it? There were, well, yeah. in addition to the uh, NLM sure. grant, uh, I started out originally doing uh, work on cattle diseases, uh, bovine respiratory diseases principally, and uh, there was a program uh, called preconditioning in which cattle were vaccinated at the farm of origin and weaned from their mothers well ahead of the time that they were shipped to a feedlot to be fed out. Uh, uh, then as I moved into swine, uh, I worked on selenium vitamin E deficiency, which was a uh, problem with uh, young, fast-growing pigs in especially the Carroll County area, Carroll, Clinton, White County areas. Uh, selenium uh, is deficient in the area. Consequently, it was deficient in the feedstuffs that the pigs got, and consequently, they developed uh, a selenium deficiency, which would actually kill them. And there were some really substantial losses. And Dr. John Van Vliet, uh, who is now associate dean, but at that time he came as, a, uh, as an assistant professor in, in uh, pathology. Uh, he had worked on uh, selenium vitamin E at the University of Illinois, and so John Van Vliet uh, and Dr. Harvey Olander and I uh, worked on uh, producing or in, uh, studied a product uh, that was injected into pigs to prevent selenium deficiency, and eventually that was marketed, uh, and that problem no longer exists anymore among pigs in Carroll and White and. 
Clinton counties or any place else for that matter. Very, now. very good. That's good to know. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the library. Uh, well, the when I came, of course, uh, uh, Ann Kirker was the librarian. and The Ann first one. The first one, sure. and, and Ann was a terrific uh, librarian. Uh, she ran an orderly library, but she was always looking for input into what she could put in the library that would be helpful to faculty members and how she could uh, be helpful to faculty members. Uh, I would take uh, some pretty silly requests to Ann uh, because I should have known my way around the library, but she, she would always very courteously uh, show me where things were and help me find what I was looking for. She was, she was tremendous. Uh, and that facility that, they, that was the original library was not easy to deal with. No, it wasn't, although it's uh, for a veterinary library at, at that at time, time, that was a pretty good sized library, but for what and needed. It and kept was, adding. To it was very. It was a very small facility, mm -hmm. but she, she worked at it and she made her case and uh, she kept adding to it. Yeah, that's right. And she got extra storage space in different spots. <laughs> I remember her telling me that up in the attic somewhere. All over. <laughs> All right. Oh, are you still in professional associations? Are you still involved with any in the Indiana one, and or are there others? Well, I'm still. Of course, sure. now I'm I'm uh, uh, a retired member and so a life member of the Indiana Veterinary Medical Association, the American Veterinary Medical Association, the American uh, Association of Swine Veterinarians. Now it used to be swine practitioners, but now it's swine veterinarians. Um, do you still go to any of the national meetings? I, I go to very few of them anymore uh, because uh, the profession has moved on so far. I retired in 93, consulted uh, until 98, and since 98 the profession, in, in especially in swine medicine, has just changed tremendously. Uh, in what way? Would you want to comment? What well, the 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 operations have gotten so much larger. The uh, veterinarian's uh, role has changed tremendously where veterinarians are much more now, they're much more uh, doing a lot more consulting uh, as opposed to on the farm uh, diagnosis and treatment kind of thing. Um, there are fewer and fewer farms, and so consequently, uh, right. the need for veterinarians is is much. Le the need for the number of veterinarians uh, is is much less in swine, but the opportunities for young veterinarians who are willing to travel. Uh, a lot of a lot of veterinarians, the most successful veterinarians now, are traveling over several states and and some of them over several countries and some of them over several continents. So it's changed tremendously from from being something where you could confine yourself to Indiana or the or the surrounding counties. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, now you mentioned a little bit about retirement, Dan, but. One other item that I was going to ask, you did do some mentoring of the students after you had retired from the school. I did. And what else have you been doing as well? I did before, uh, before I retired. Uh, that was one of the things that I enjoyed most was uh, I counseled a good number of students over the years. Uh, some of them uh, uh, still joke about uh, by sending them abroad to study uh, to Iowa, for instance, <laughs> and they they joke about that, but they they uh, they were a source of uh, of great enjoyment to me, and 
after uh, I retired, uh, they have a course now that's applications and integrations for both first year and second year veterinary students. And they break up into small groups and solve problems and they need a, a uh, tutor, they call it, but it's really someone to kind of make sure they just don't go off the track or off the deep end. Uh, you're not there to provide information, you're simply uh, trying to provide a little guidance to them. And I enjoyed that. I did that for, oh, five or six years, uh, seven years maybe after mm -hmm. I graduated, after I retired. Um, and I consulted, uh, a, a lot of uh, my consulting was with the Professional Examination Service uh, who made up uh, the National Board examinations for veterinarians and I would uh, go to veterinary schools and hold item writing workshops for veterin veterinary faculty members and they would write questions for the national board which would then be taken into a pool and screened and worked over several times before they actually sure. got on the uh, board examination. But that was, that was uh, enjoyable because I got to see most of the veter well, I, I have visited every veterinary school in the United States and Canada, and uh, some of them two or three times. And it's been enjoyable to see other schools right. and how they work. All right. And I've always been impressed by one, the family attitude at Purdue and the willingness to participate and, and get things done. Uh, that's not true of every school. <laughs> right. How has the, in, uh, uh, the uh, entrance requirements have changed over time for the vet school? Um, well, the class size is kept pretty stable. Is it about 60 or 70? Yeah, the class size when I first came in 64 was about 60 students. And we got up to 72 uh, when the federal government uh, uh, provided funds for taking out-of-state students. And so we got up to 72. Then when those funds dried up, the faculty made a decision to drop back to 60. And now it, it varies. Uh, one of the things that's, that's different now, I think about the time I came, there were maybe oh, 200 or 200 plus students applying for those 60 positions. Uh, at one time, it got up to uh, between eight and 900 students applying for 72 positions. Uh, I think it's still pretty high. I don't know exactly how mm -hmm. high it is, but it's still a large number of students applying for for essentially 60 positions. But the school has found that, that those students also apply other places, and so they have to offer more than 60 positions to uh, uh, be sure that they wow. do uh, maintain 60 students. But uh, the requirements, uh, when, when, again, when I first came, two, two years was pretty much the standard pre-veterinary. Uh, of course, now most students go four years, uh, so they really have got an eight-year program versus a, a sure. six-year program. Right. There are still some that only go six years. Right. And, but. I'd, I'd say the majority is probably right. higher than that now. Have the uh, graduate work increased? I mean, is there more masters and PhDs that are moving in this area for the vet school? No, more but... More than compared to when you came? Uh, probably not in, in actual graduate work, but within the clinical area, mm. that has the number of, uh, of, of people that go on to uh, internships and then go on to residencies, that has increased. And the number of, uh, 
of people that are board certified uh, who pass boards in a particular area like uh, surgery or cardiology or uh, microbiology. Or they, th th those areas have increased tremendously and a lot of them are, are now in private practice. And so where it used to be the only board certified people or the majority of them were on the faculties of veterinary schools. Now uh, the, you have board certified practices where the entire practice are board certified surgeons or board certified ophthalmologists. Mm -hmm. And that's tremendously different than it used to be. Sure, that's right, yeah. Now we'll move on to your favorite Purdue tradition. Well, I think, I think that uh, the I Am an American uh, that's played during the flag ceremony before football games, that's my favorite tradition. And I, I always enjoy that, and I enjoy watching the fans from the opposing team because for many of them, they haven't heard it before and they're really taken by it. Yeah. Um, I, I have to share one story with Please. you. Uh, a friend of mine, a, a cat practitioner from Philadelphia, uh, was out here speaking at the fall conference, and she had gone to the University of Connecticut for undergraduate and, for, and to the University of Pennsylvania for graduate. And at that time, or for veterinary school, and, and at that time, uh, Connecticut was not a, a football school at all, neither was Penn. And I said, Sue, why don't, you, uh, why don't you stay over and go to the football game with me on uh, Saturday? Because you've never been to a, a big time college football game. Well, she decided to do that. And that was at the time that uh, Bill Moffat was in charge of the Purdue Band. And if you recall at that time, he had the, uh, the long trumpets and the, 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 the national anthem was played with a lot of frills. And Sue was uh, standing next to me for that, and she got, went through the I Am an American and the national anthem. And the tears were running down her face. <laughs> <laughs> really hit her. <laughs> well, she said, you know, growing up or being in Philadelphia, which is the cradle of liberty, it was a, right. an amazing experience for her. Oh. Um, any out, uh, how about an outstanding event in your life you'd like to share with us? Well, the outstanding event in my life was when I married my wife. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask you a little about your family, the children. Uh, we do. Uh, I, I met uh, Barbara, my, my wife, uh, in a church basement at Iowa State when we were sophomore students. And uh, we have uh, two children, both boys, Scott, uh, who is an executive out in New Jersey, and uh, Todd, who is a uh, producer of a conservative talk show in Indianapolis. Okay. Right. Uh, any and our younger granddaughter oh. is coming to Purdue this fall. Sounds good. Any questions that uh, weren't asked or any topics that you'd like to, in closing, uh, make some comments on? No. Uh, I had an opportunity to uh, read uh, an interview that uh, I think it was Ann Kirker did with Jack Stockton when he retired, and he talked about uh, family at the vet school. And he's right about that. Uh, that's been that was probably the the most enjoyable part about uh, working at Purdue was, regardless of disagreements, everybody felt that they were family yeah. at the school, and that was that made the working working situation a very pleasant experience. Right. One final thing, your school is celebrating an anniversary next year. Do you want to comment for the researchers what some of the tentative plans are? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of all the plans right. for the 50th but the planning anniversary, is in the state. But, <laughs> but I know that there are a lot of things uh, being planned and that uh, 2009 will be the 50th 
year since the start of the school. And one of the things that we're doing is, is writing the history of the school. And again, that's been a very pleasant experience to go back and dig through the archives and through the uh, uh, publications over the years and see the interesting things that have happened, uh, both the professional things and the serious things, and some of the not so serious right. things. And also some pictures that go along with it should yeah. be interesting <laughs> to look at, right? We'll be anxious to see that. <laughs> oh, well, this concludes the, uh, the interview, and thank you very much, Dr. Meyer. Thank Appreciate you. It. It's okay, a pleasure. thanks.